Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, on behalf of the Migration Network and um, provide you with a bit of an overview of what's happening on an EU level um, in the field of student retention. So I'm here to present the preliminary findings of an ongoing EMN study um, on attracting and retaining international students in the EU. So this study has not yet been published, but it is ongoing at the moment and it will be published in May. Um, yes, so as I mentioned, the, um, the study itself focuses on both the attraction and the retention aspect, but I'll be focusing only on the retention side um, for the purpose of this presentation. So just to give you an idea of uh, what you can expect from my presentation, um, I'll briefly mention the aim and the scope of our study, um, the policy and legislative context, both um, on a national and the EU level. And then I will also provide you with a bit of um, a statistical overview on international student mobility, um, and then dive straight into the retention um, side, so the possibility to stay after the completion of studies in member states, some policy measures and incentives to retain international students that member states are implementing, and also briefly looking into some initiatives of the higher education institutes and the private sector. Um, then I'll give a brief overview of some common challenges um, that I'm yeah, that member states are facing, and I will also give you a good practice example um, that has been, uh, or that is going to be mentioned in the framework of this study. And I'll conclude with some uh, preliminary learning points that we've already gathered. So, um, yes, this study aims to explore the national policies and practices in member states to attract and retain international students. A total of 24 member states are participating in the study and we are covering roughly the period 2012 to 2018. So one of the reasons why the study is so timely um, at the moment is because of the Students and Researchers Directive of 2016, which member states had to transpose by May 2018. So as a result of, those, of this directive, many changes have been implemented in member states, and um, we are looking into, um, yeah, into this in the framework of the study. But even before 2016, of course, student attraction and retention has been always a topical issue. For example, it's been mentioned or reiterated in the uh, 2015 European Agenda on Migration that there is a clear need for promoting student mobility and for the EU to feature as an attractive destination for talent. And, um, but even long before that, back in 1994, it was already on the radar of the EU, um, where the Council adopted resolutions um, addressing the admission of third country national students in EU member states. So at a national level, um, the study found that this is indeed a topic that's a policy priority in many member states. Not in all of them, but the majority of member states do really consider this an important issue. And as had been mentioned by some of the previous speakers, um, economic considerations do play a key role here, as international students provide considerable value to the economy. Next to that, there is also a clear need for qualified labor in many member states, um, with labor shortages being a challenge um, across the EU. And this is, of course, where the retention policies really start to kick in. But next to these two um, factors, um, we also have to consider that international students are considered quite important ambassadors for their country and they're a potential resource for, resource for future international partnerships as well. So um, we found that the transposition of the Students and Researchers Directive has been completed in almost all of the member states, or many member states are uh, close to um, completing it at the moment. And many recent policy changes that have been implemented either in the framework of the directive or by the member state itself and, and in the, independent of the directive um, and facilitating the administrative process of immigration and also improve labor market access, both during and after the studies. But I'll go more into detail later on. So to provide you with a brief statistical overview, um, we have found that, or your study data shows that in 2017, more than 530,000 first residence permits were issued for the purpose of study. But, of course, there are significant differences in the number of residence permits across the EU. So the UK, France, and Germany actually make up over half of all residence permits issued. And the main countries of origin are China, US, and India, but, of course, there are quite big differences across the EU there as well. 
then we have, uh, in the framework of the study, we have asked member states to provide us with um, some data on the proportion of international students among the member states' student population. And we found that in 2016, um, the UK actually had the largest proportion of third country national students among its general population, followed by Cyprus, Germany, and Hungary. And with the exception of four member states, international students generally form a more sizable proportion of the student population than mobile EU students. All right, then now diving straight into the retention aspect. Article 25.1 of the Students and Research Directive provides the possibility to stay for a minimum period of nine months after the completion of the studies. This has already mentioned, been mentioned by um, some of our previous speakers. And member states have indeed implemented this provision, but quite in different ways. So there are some that really grant this period only for nine months, but others go much further than that and um, actually provide the possibility to stay for up to 18 months. So quite big differences here. And uh, during this period, usually member states um, issue permits for the purpose of seeking employment. Um, yeah. So more than half of member states adopted specific measures that are not necessarily of a legislative nature um, to retain international students. And a very common measure here was the exemption uh, from labor market tests, um, which usually would apply to other third country nationals. In some member states, there's also no need uh, to obtain a work permit, or there's no obligation to, to adhere to a salary um, threshold. Yet other member states don't restrict the job field, for instance, that international graduates are allowed to work in, but that restriction does apply in some member states. Some, some member states require the international students to actually work in the same field that they studied. But all in all, we found that in many member states, access to the labor market is greatly facilitated for international graduates uh, compared to normal third country nationals that haven't studied in the member state. So next to those um, rather measures on a state level, the majority of member states um, reported that higher education institutes and the private sector do play a key role in implementing um, further initiatives and measures to retain international graduates. Um, but of course, the scale and the scope of initiatives varied greatly across member states and also within member states. Some higher education institutes were much more active in that field than others. Uh, a very common initiative was the setup of career centers to provide assistance and counseling to students. And in some cases, they also um, helped them find internships, for example. Another common measure was the organization of job fairs and um, the creation of job portals for international graduates where they could find relevant job offers for them. Um, sometimes free legal, legal advice was also offered and um, many higher education institutes collaborate closely with the private sector as well. For example, some, in some member states there, uh, there are mentor mentorship programs in place where the higher education institute matches the international graduate with a, with a relevant uh, potential employer. But of course, all of this doesn't come without challenges. Um, we've already heard today that um, insufficient language skills to enter, the, uh, to enter the labor market is quite a big issue. And this has been found to be the case across the EU, actually. And um, this is especially the case in countries where English language programs were widely on offer, and most member states do offer um, English language programs. So indeed, while it is an important factor for student attraction, it doesn't always work in favor of student retention. Um, so for some member states, uh, the competitiveness of their labor market conditions and living standards was reported to be a challenge especially for in, in, in terms of salary. We've already heard today that um, there are quite different uh, levels of salary between Estonia and Finland, and this has been reported by other member states as well. Um, the cost of living in some member states is much higher than in others, so they struggle to, to retain them. Uh, for example, the cost of housing is often a big problem. And then there's more the administrative side of long processing times for the extension of permits, which also stands in the way of, of successful student retention. So in the framework of the study, we've um, also looked at or asked member states to um, point to some good practice examples. And today, um, we, um, yeah, we chose to present um, 
the orientation here, which is implemented in the Netherlands. And, um, which, and this provides international graduates to, uh, with the possibility to file an application for a special residence permit, which gives them access to the labor market for, the period, for a period of one year. And quite a unique feature here is that uh, the international graduate can apply for this for up to three years after they've graduated. So they can actually first return to their country of origin and then come back to the Netherlands as long as it's within three years. Um, and it's also possible to apply for a new orientation year if um, after the first orientation year a new study program has been completed. So coming to um, our learning points so far from the study, we found that indeed, as I mentioned, retention measures are mostly policy oriented. There's not so much legislation in place. Um, and they mostly, of course, seek to facilitate the labor market access. But some additional facilitation measures are also implemented uh, in member states such as career centers. And this is where the higher education institutes really play a big role, as they can help bridge the gap between graduation and entering the labor market. Um, but considering some of the challenges with regard to retention that, that I've mentioned, for example, the lack of language skills, we really found that retention policy should already be thought about during the period of study. So, uh, additional, uh, offering additional language courses for international students um, or helping them find internships during their, uh, during their study would also be um, of great help to then um, facilitate the retention in the long term. So that's basically it. Um, just to say that indeed um, this study um, will be published in May or the synthesis report for the study will be published in May. Um, and um, in the meantime, you can already find some national reports for the study online, which give you um, very in-depth information on the, uh, on the situation of attraction and retention policies in individual member states. So um, yeah, I invite you to look, look out for the upcoming um, publication. You can follow the EMN on Twitter in the meantime to get updates uh, on our activities on a regular basis. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. So we have uh, time for one or two questions from the audience uh, to just let us know by raising your hand that you want to ask something. Uh, <laughs> since uh, you need some time to rethink, uh, okay, Ero. Yes, I can, I can ask. Um, two words, very simple. What next? The next five years, the next 10 years, the next 15 years of the ideas of the European Commission. What are you going to do next with that topic? Because you are improving every year. Every year. There are yeah. new legislation coming up, but your vision. <laughs> well, I'm in, not in a position really to speak on behalf of the European Commission. <laughs> um, but we, uh, indeed, this seems to be a, very, a topic of great inter interest. And uh, um, for instance, programs such as the Erasmus Plus program do play a big role, and um, it's been this type of program or these types of program have really been um, yeah, on, 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 a, on the forefront now at, um, and have been intensified greatly. So there are more and more efforts, um, definitely. And we found also, I didn't include it here in this presentation because it doesn't necessarily relate to retention, but more and more member states are also um, uh, con conducting or yeah, cooperation with third countries. Um, so in the framework of development aid, for instance, they're trying to get more and more um, yeah, international graduates, uh, international students, sorry, at the EU as well. And the commission is, is facilitating, or is trying to facilitate that as well. But um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not from the European Commission, so I can't speak on their behalf, sorry. <laughs> I don't, aha, okay, good. <laughs> Please uh, introduce yourself also. Yeah. Seda ka, et küsimusi võib esitada ka eesti keeles. Meil on siin tõlge olemas. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marilis Baker, uh, Honorary Consul of Pakistan in Estonia. 
And actually, my question is about Brexit. Uh, how do you think Brexit will influence the student migration? And uh, can Estonian universities expect a boost of international students because they don't want to go to the US or UK anymore? <laughs> Um, well, as you know, the Brexit situation is still very unclear. I mean, the official date for Brexit was today, um, but uh, we really don't know what's happening. But of course, if the UK is no longer an EU member state, um, then first of all, the statistics would greatly change because the UK is such an important uh, destination for international students in the EU. And of course, it will, would affect uh, student mobility um, within the UK, and uh, sorry, within the EU as well. Um, so, yeah, basically th UK um, students would be considered third country nationals <laughs> if they are really, um, if they are really going to leave the EU. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict, um, I don't know, yeah. Okay, I think our time is up. Okay. Thank you, Norma. Thank you.